Hello there. This is a reading from my podcast called Down to Sleep, where I read books to you to help you fall asleep at night. There is a new episode every Monday on Spotify and podcast apps. If you enjoy this podcast, then please consider joining me on Patreon for a few dollars a month. You support the podcast, you get two readings a week, and you get access to every single episode so far at patreon.com slash down to sleep. Thank you. Now, let's tuck you in. Take a nice deep breath for me. Hit that like and subscribe. And let's get down to sleep. We continue with chapter five. The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate four feet, their heads thrown back and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air. As the two animals hastened by in high spirits with much chatter, and laughter. They were returning across country after a long day's outing with Otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams tributary to their own river had their first small beginnings. The shades of the short winter day were closing in on them, and they had still some distance to go. Plodding at random across the plough, they had heard the sheep and had made for them, and now, leading from the sheep pen, they found a beaten track that made walking a lighter business, and responded to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakably, yes, quite right, this leads home. It looks as if we were coming to a village, said the mole, somewhat dubiously, slackening his pace. The track that had in time become a path and had developed into a lane now handed them over to the charge of a well-metalled road. The animals did not hold with villages and their own highways, thickly frequented as they were, took an independent course, regardless of church, post office, or public house. Oh, never mind, said the rat. At this season of the year, they're all safe indoors by this time, sitting round the fire. Men, women, children, dogs, and cats and all. We shall slip through all right, without any bother or unpleasantness, and we can have a look at them through their windows if you like, see what they're doing. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of a dusky orange-red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low latisse windows were innocent of blinds. To the lookers-in from outside, the inmates gathered around a tea table, absorbed in handiwork or talking with laughter and gesture. They had each that happy grace, which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture. The natural grace which goes with perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theatre to another, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes. They watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smouldering log. But it was from one little window, with its blind drawn down, a mere blank transparency on the night, that the sense of home and the little curtained world within walls, the larger stressful world of outside nature shut out and forgotten, most pulsated. Close against the white blind hung a bird cage, clearly silhouetted. Every wire and perch was distinct and recognisable, even to yesterday's dull-edged lump of sugar. 
on the middle perch, the fluffy occupant, head tucked well into feathers, it seemed so near to them as to be easily stroked had they tried. Even the delicate tips of his plumped out plumage penciled plainly on the illuminated screen. As they looked, the sleepy little fellow stirred uneasily, woke, shook himself, and raised his head. They could see the gape of his tiny beak as he yawned in a bored sort of way, looked around and settled his head into his back again, where ruffled feathers gradually subsided into a perfect stillness. Then a gust of bitter wind took them in the back of the neck, a small sting of frozen sleet on the skin. It woke them as from a dream, and they knew their toes to be cold and their legs tired, and their own home was a distant, weary way. Once beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness those friendly fields again. They braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch that we know is bound to end sometime. In the rattle of the door latch in the sudden firelight, the sight of familiar things greeting us as long absent travellers from far over sea. They plodded along steadily, silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper. As it was pitch dark and it was all a strange country for him as far as he knew, he was following obediently in the wake of the rat, leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as was his habit, his shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the straight grey road in front of him. He did not notice poor Mole when suddenly the summons reached him and took him like an electric shock. We others who have long lost the more subtle of the physical senses have not even the proper terms to express an animal's into communications with his surroundings, living or otherwise. We have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of those mysterious fairy calls from out the void that had suddenly reached the mole in the darkness, making him tingle through and through with its very familiar appeal. Even while yet he could not clearly remember what it was, he stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture this fine filament the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment, and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in its fullest flood. Home. That was what they meant. Those caressing appeals, those soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at the moment. His old home, that he had hurriedly forsaken and never sought again, that day when he first found the river. And now it was sending out its scouts and its messengers to capture him and bring him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he had hardly given it a thought. So absorbed had he been in his new life and all of its pleasures and its surprises, its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood up before him in the darkness. Shabby indeed, 
small and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home that he had made for himself, the home he had been so happy to get back to after a day's work. The home had been happy with him too, evidently, and was missing him. It wanted him back, and it was telling him so, through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only with plaintive reminder that it was there, and that it wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain. He must obey it instantly, and go. Ratty, he called, full of joyful excitement. Hold on. Uh, come back. I want you, quick. Oh, come along, Mole, do, replied the rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, pleading the poor Mole in anguish of heart. You don't understand. It's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it. It's close by here, really quite close, and I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty. Please, please come back. The rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice, and he was much taken up with the weather, for he too could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. Mole, we mustn't stop now, really, he called back. We'll come for it tomorrow, whatever it is you found. But I daren't stop now. It's late, and the snow's coming on again, and I'm not sure of the way. And I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick, there's a good fellow. The rat pressed forward on his way without waiting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road. His heart was torn asunder. A big sob was gathering, gathering, somewhere low down inside him. To leap up to the surface presently, he knew in passionate escape. But even under such a test as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile, the wafts from his old home pleaded, whispered, conjured, and finally claimed him imperiously. He dared not tarry longer within their magic circle, with a wrench that tore his very heartstrings. He set his face down the road and followed submissively in the track of the rat, while faint, thin little smells dogged at his retreating nose, reproaching him for his new friendship and his callous forgetfulness. With an effort, he caught up to the unsuspecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they would do when they got back, how jolly a fire of logs in the parlour would be what a supper he meant to eat. Never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind. At last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, Look here, mole, old chap. You seem dead tired. No talk left in you. Your feet are dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a moment and rest. The snow's held off so far. The best part of our journey's over. The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried to control himself. He felt it surely coming. The sob that he had fought with so long refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way to the air. And then another, and another, and others thick and fast until poor Mole at last gave up the struggle and cried 
freely and helplessly and openly now that he knew it was all over and that he had lost what he could hardly have said to have found. The rat, astonished and dismayed at the violence of Mole's grief, did not speak for a while. At last he said, very quietly and sympathetically, What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter, tell us your trouble and let me see what I can do. Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out between the upheavals of his chest that followed one upon another so quickly and held back speech and choked it as it came. I know it's a shabby, dingy little place, he sobbed forth at last, broken. Not like your cosy quarters or Toad's beautiful hall or Badger's great house, but it was my own little home, and I was fond of it. And I went away, and I forgot all about it, and then I smelt it suddenly on the road. When I called, and you wouldn't listen, Rat, and everything came back to me with a rush, and I wanted it. Oh dear, and when you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, and I had to leave it, though I was smelling it all the time, I, I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone and had one look at it, Ratty, only one look. It was close by, but you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, you wouldn't turn back. Recollection brought fresh waves of sorrow, and sobs again took full charge of him, preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time, he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I have been, a pig, that's me, just a pig, a plain pig. He waited until Mole's sobs became gradually less stormy and more rhythmical. He waited till the last sniffs were frequent and sobs were intermittent. He rose from his seat and, remarking carelessly, Well, we'd uh, really better be getting on, old chap, and set off up the road again, over the toilsome way that they had come. Wherever are you going to, Ratty? cried the tearful mole, looking up in alarm. We're going to find that home of yours, old fellow, replied the rat pleasantly. So you'd better come along, for it'll take some finding, and we shall want your nose. Oh, come back, ratty, do, cried the mole, getting up and hurrying after him. It's no good, I tell you, it, it's too late and too dark, and the place is far off, the snow's coming. I, I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way about it. It was an accident and a mistake. Think of the riverbank and your supper. Hang riverbank and supper too, said the rat heartily. I tell you, I'm going to find this place now if I stay out all night. So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm. We'll soon be back there again. Still snuffling and pleading and reluctant, the mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road by his imperious companion who by a flow of cheerful talk and anecdote endeavoured to beguile his spirits back and make the weary way seem shorter. When at last it seemed to the rat that they must be nearing the part of the road where the mole had been held up, he said, Now, no more talking. Business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for a little way. Suddenly, the rat was conscious, through his arm that was linked in the moles, of a faint sort of electric thrill that was passing down that animal's body. Instantly, he disengaged himself and fell back a pace and waited. The signals were coming through. 
Mole stood a moment rigid. His uplifted nose, quivering slightly, felt the air. Then, a short, quick run forward. A fault. A check. A try-back. And then a slow and steady, confident advance. The rat, much excited, kept close to his heels as the mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field open and trackless and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the rat was on alert and followed him down the tunnel, to which his unerring nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless. The earthy smell was strong. It seemed a long time to Rat ere the passage ended, and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. The Mole struck a match, and by its light the Rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot. Directly facing them was Mole's little front door, with Mole End painted in gothic lettering over the bell pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it. The rat, looking around him, saw that they were in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and on the other, a roller. For the mole, who was a tidy animal when at home, could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statuary. Gary Baldy and the infant Samuel, Queen Victoria and other heroes of modern Italy. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley, with benches along it and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish, surrounded by a cockle-shell border. Out of the center of the pond rose a fanciful erection clothed in more cockle-shells, topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of these objects so dear to him. He hurried Rat through the door, lit a lamp in the hall and took one glance around his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of a long-neglected house, its narrow dimensions, its worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. Oh, ratty, he cried dismally. Why ever did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this? when you might have been at Riverbank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire with all of your own nice things about you. The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, lighting lamps and candles and sticking them up everywhere. What a capital little house this is, he called out cheerfully. So compact, so well planned. Everything here and everything in its place. We'll make a jolly night out of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So this is the parlour? Splendid. Your own idea, those little sleeping bunks in the wall? Capital. Uh, now I'll fetch the wood and the coals and get a duster mole. You'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table. Try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his inspiriting companion, the mole roused himself, 
dusted and polished with energy and heartiness, while the rat running to and fro with armfuls of fuel soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He hailed the mole to come and warm himself, but mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in a dark despair, burying his face in the duster. Rat, he moaned, how about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the rat reproachfully. Why, only just now, I, I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser, quite distinctly. Everybody knows that means there are sardines somewhere in the neighbourhood. Rouse yourself, pull yourself together, come with me and forage. They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard, turning out every drawer. The result was not so very depressing after all. Of course, it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of captain's biscuits nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. There's a banquet for you, observed the rat. He arranged the table. I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight. No bread, groaned the mole. No butter, no... No pâté, no foie gras, no champagne, continued the rat, grinning. And that reminds me. What's that little door at the end of the passage? Your cellar, of course. Every luxury in the house. Just wait a minute. He made for the cellar door, and presently reappeared. Somewhat dusty, and with a bottle of beer in each paw, and another under each arm. Self-indulgent beggar you seem to be, Mole, he observed. Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I ever was in. Wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so homelike, they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Uh, tell us all about it. How you came to make it what it is. And while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks and mustard which he mixed in an egg cup the mole his bosom heaving with the stress of recent emotion related somewhat shyly at first but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject how this was planned how that was thought out and how this was got through a windfall from an aunt and that was a wonderful find and a bargain and this other thing was brought out of laborious savings and a certain amount of going without. His spirits finally quite restored. He must needs go and caress his possessions. Take a lamp and show off their points to his visitor. Quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed, Rat, who was desperately hungry but strove to conceal it, nodded seriously examining with a puckered brow and saying wonderful and most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given. At last the rat succeeded in decoying him to the table and had just got seriously to work with the sardine opener when sounds were heard from the forecourt. Sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel, a confused murmur of tiny voices, broken sentences reaching them. All in a line, hold the lantern up a bit, Tommy, clear your throats first, no coughing after I say one, two, three. Where's young Bill? Come on, we're all waiting. What's up? inquired the rat, pausing in his labours. I think it must be the field mice, replied the mole, a touch of pride in his manner. They go round carol singing regularly, this time of year. They're quite an institution in these parts, and they never pass me over. They come to Mole End last, 
I used to give them hot drinks and supper too, when I could afford it. It'll be like old times to hear them again. Let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight, a seasonable one. It met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red comforters around their throats, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, feet jigging for warmth. With bright beady eyes they glanced shyly at each other, sniggering a little and sniffing, applying coat sleeves a good deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers had composed in the fields that were fallow and held by frost or when snowbound in chimney corners handed down to be sung in the street to lamplit windows at yule time villagers all this frosty tide let your doors swing open wide Though wind may follow and snow beside, draw us in by your fire to bide. Joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand in the cold and the sleet, blowing fingers and stamping feet. Come from far away you to greet, you by the fire, we in the street, bidding you joy in the morning. For ere one half of the night was gone, sudden a star has led us on, raining bliss and benison, bliss tomorrow and more anon, joy for every morning. Goodman Joseph toiled through the snow, saw the star over a stable low, Mary she might not further go. Welcome thatch and litter below. Joy was hers in the morning. And then they heard the angels tell. Who were the first to cry Noel? Animals all as it befell. In the stable where they did dwell. Joy shall be theirs in the morning. The voices ceased. The singers, bashful but smiling exchanged sidelong glances and silence succeeded but for a moment only from up above and far away down the tunnel that they had so lately traveled was borne to their ears in a faint musical hum the sound of distant bells ringing a joyful peal very well sung boys cried the rat heartily and now come along in all of you. Warm yourselves by the fire and have something hot. Yes, uh, come along, field mice, cried the mole eagerly. This is quite like old times. Shut the door after you. Uh, pull up that settee to the fire. Just wait a minute while we... Ratty, he cried in despair, plumping down on a seat with tears impending. Whatever are we doing? We've got nothing to give them. You leave that to me, said the masterful rat. Here, you with the lantern, come this way, I want to talk to you. Tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir, replied the field mouse respectfully. At this time of year, our shops keep open to all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once, you and your lantern, and you get me... Here much muttered conversation ensued. The mole only heard bits of it, such as fresh mind and no, a pound of that will do. See you get Bugginses, for I won't have any other. Only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Of course, homemade. No tinned stuff. 
do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice perched in a row on the settee, their small legs swinging, giving themselves up to the enjoyment of the fire. They toasted their chillblains until they tingled, while the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them recite the names of numerous brothers who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to carol that year. But they looked forward to very shortly after winning a parental consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label of one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be an old burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible mole, the very thing. Now we'll be able to mull some ale. Get things ready, mole, whilst I draw the corks. It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater into the red heart of the fire. Soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting that he had ever been cold in all of his life. They act plays too, these fellows, the mole explained. Make them all up by themselves and act them afterwards. Very well they do too. They gave us a capital one last year as a field mouse who was captured at sea. Made to row in a galley. When he escaped and got home again, his lady love had gone into a con. You, you were in it, I, I remember. Uh, come on, get up and recite a bit. The field mouse addressed got up on his legs, giggled shyly and looked around the room. He remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on, Mole coaxed and encouraged him, and the rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him. But nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busily engaged on him, like watermen applying the Royal Humane Society's regulations to a case of long submersion. When the latch clicked, the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. There was no more talk of play-acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had tumbled out onto the table. Under the generalship of Rat, everybody was set to do something or to fetch something. In a very few minutes, supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table in a sort of dream, saw a lately barren board set thick with savoury comforts, saw his little friend's faces brighten and beam as they fell to without delay, and let himself loose for he was famished indeed. On the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out. As they ate, they talked of old times. The field mice gave him the local gossip and answered as well as they could the hundred questions that he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing only taking care that each guest had what he wanted, and plenty of it, and that Mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful, showering wishes of the season with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for small brothers and sisters at home. When the door closed on the last of them, and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked the fire up, drew the chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale, and discussed the events of the long day. At last, the Rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, I'll, I'll take this. 
What a ripping little house this is. Everything's so handy. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in the blankets. Slumber gathered him forthwith as a swathe of barley folded into the arms of a reaping machine. The weary mole was glad to turn in without delay. Soon his head was on his pillow, in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and now smilingly received him back. He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even it all was, but clearly too how much it all meant to him. The special value of some anchorage in one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon the new life and its splendid spaces, to turn his back on the sun and the air and all that it offered him to creep home and stay there. The upper world was all too strong. It called to him still even down there. He knew he must return to the larger stage. But it was good to think that he had this to come back to. This place which was all his own. These things which were so glad to see him again. And could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. Chapter 6 Mr. Toad It was a bright morning in the early part of summer. The river had resumed its wonted banks and its accustomed pace, and a hot sun seemed to be pulling everything green and bushy and spiky up out of the earth towards him as if by strings. The mole and the water rat had been up since dawn, very busy on matters connected with boats and the opening of the boating season. Painting and varnishing, mending paddles, repairing cushions, hunting for missing boat hooks and so on, and were finishing breakfast in their little parlour and eagerly discussing their plans for the day. When a heavy knock sounded at the door. Bother, said the rat, all over egg. See who it is, mole, like a good chap, since you finished. The mole went to attend the summons, and the rat heard him utter a cry of surprise. He flung the parlour door open, and announced with much importance, Mr. Badger. This was a wonderful thing indeed, that the badger should pay a formal call on them, or indeed on anybody. He generally had to be caught if he wanted him badly, as he slipped quietly along a hedgerow of an early morning or a late evening, or else hunted up in his own house in the middle of the wood, which was a serious undertaking. The badger strode heavily into the room and stood looking at the two animals with an expression full of seriousness. The rat let his egg spoon fall on the tablecloth and sat open-mouthed. The hour has come, said the badger at last, with great solemnity. What hour? asked the rat uneasily, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. Whose hour, you should rather say, replied the badger. Why, Toad's hour. The hour of Toad. I said I would take him in hand as soon as the winter was well over. 
and I'm going to take him in hand today. Toad's hour, of course, cried the mole delightedly. Hooray! I remember now. We'll teach him to be a sensible toad. This very morning, continued the badger, taking an armchair, as I learned last night from a trustworthy source, another new and exceptionally powerful motor car will arrive at Toad Hall on approval or return. At this very moment, perhaps, Toad is busy arraying himself in those singularly hideous habiliments so dear to him, which transform him from a comparatively good-looking toad into an object which throws any decent-minded animal that comes across it into a violent fit. We must be up and doing, ere it is too late. You two animals will accompany me instantly to Toad Hall, and the work of rescue shall be accomplished. Right you are, cried the rat, starting up. We'll rescue the poor unhappy animal. We'll convert him. He'll be the most converted toad that ever was before we've done with him. They set off up the road on their mission of mercy, Badger leading the way. Animals, when in company, walk in a proper and sensible manner, in single file, instead of sprawling across the road and being of no use or support to each other in case of sudden trouble or danger. They reached the carriage drive of Toad Hall to find, as the badger had anticipated, a shiny new motor car of great size, painted a bright red, Toad's favourite colour, standing in front of the house. As they neared the door, it was flung open, and Mr. Toad, arrayed in goggles, cap, gaiters, and enormous overcoat, came swaggering down the steps, drawing on his gauntleted gloves. Hello, come on you fellows, he cried cheerfully on catching sight of them. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly, to come for a jolly, for a, a jolly. His hearty accents faltered and fell away as he noticed the stern, unbending look on the countenances of his silent friends. His invitation remained unfinished. The badger strode up to the steps. Take him inside, he said sternly to his companions. And as Toad was hustled through the door, struggling and protesting, he turned to the chauffeur in charge of the new motor car. I'm afraid you won't be wanted today, he said. Mr. Toad has changed his mind. You will not require the car. Please understand that this is final. You needn't wait. Then he followed the others inside and shut the door. Now then, he said to the toad, when the four of them were stood together in the hall. First of all, take those ridiculous things off. Shan't, replied Toad with great spirit. What is the meaning of this gross outrage? I demand an instant explanation. Take them off him then, you two, ordered the badger briefly. They had to lay Toad out on the floor, kicking and calling all sorts of names before they could get to work properly. The rat sat on him, and the mole got his motor clothes off him bit by bit. They stood him up on his legs again. A good deal of his blustering spirit seemed to have evaporated with the removal of his fine panoply. Now that he was merely towed, and no longer the terror of the highway, he giggled feebly, and looked from one to the other appealingly, seeming quite to understand the situation. You knew it must come to this sooner or later, Toad, the badger explained severely. You've disregarded all the warnings that we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money that your father left you. 
and you're getting us animals a bad name in the district by your furious driving, your smashes, your rows with the police. Independence is all very well, and we animals will never allow our friends to make fools of themselves beyond a certain limit. And that limit you have reached. Now, you're a good fellow in many respects, and I don't want to be too hard on you. I'll make one more effort to bring you to reason. You will come with me into the smoking room, and there you will hear some facts about yourself, and we'll see whether you come out of that room the same Toad that you went in. He took Toad firmly by the arm and led him into the smoking room and closed the door behind them. That's no good, said the Rat contemptuously. Talking to Toad will never cure him. He'll say anything. They made themselves comfortable in armchairs and waited patiently. Through the closed door they could just hear a long, continuous drone of the badger's voice, rising and falling in waves of oratory. Presently they noticed that the sermon began to be punctuated at intervals by long-drawn sobs, evidently proceeding from the bosom of the toad, who was a soft-hearted and affectionate fellow, very easily converted for the time being, to any point of view. After some three quarters of an hour, the door opened, and the badger reappeared, solemnly leading by the paw a very limp and dejected toad. His skin hung baggily about him, his legs wobbled, his cheeks were furrowed by the tears so plentifully called forth by the badger's moving discourse. Sit down there, Toad, said the badger kindly, pointing to a chair. My friends, he went on, I am pleased to inform you that Toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He is truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and he has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever. I have his solemn promise to that effect. That is very good news, said the mole. Very good news indeed, observed the rat dubiously. If only, if only, he was looking very hard at Toad as he said this, and could not help thinking that he perceived something vaguely resembling a twinkle in that animal's still sorrowful eye. There's only one thing more to be done, continued a gratified badger. Toad, I want you to solemnly repeat before your friends here what you fully admitted to me in the smoking room just now. First, you're sorry for what you've done, and you see the folly of it all. There was a long, long pause. Toad looked desperately this way and that, while the other animals waited in grave silence. At last, he spoke. No, he said, a little sullenly but stoutly. I'm not sorry, and it wasn't folly. It was simply glorious. What? cried the badger, greatly scandalized. You backsliding animal, didn't you tell me just now in there? Oh yes, yes, in there, said Toad impatiently. I'd have said anything in there. You're so eloquent, dear badger, and so moving and so convincing. You put all your points so frightfully well. You can do what you like with me in there, and you know it, but I've been searching my mind since and going over things in it. And I find that I'm not a bit sorry or repellent, really, so 
It's no earthly good saying I am now, is it? Then you don't promise, said the badger, to never touch a motor car again. Certainly not, replied Toad emphatically. On the contrary, I faithfully promise that the very first motor car I see, poop, poop, off I go in it. Told you so, didn't I? Observed the rat to the mole. Very well, then, said the badger firmly, rising to his feet. Since you won't yield to persuasion, we'll try what force can do. I feared it would come to this all along. You've often asked us three to come and stay with you, Toad, in this handsome house of yours. Well, now we're going to. When we've converted you to a proper point of view, we may quit, but not before. Take him upstairs, you two, and lock him up in his bedroom, while we arrange matters between ourselves. It's for your own good, Toady, you know, said the rat kindly, as Toad, kicking and struggling, was hauled up the stairs by his two faithful friends. Think what fun we'll all have together, just as we used to, when you've got quite over this painful attack of yours. We'll take great care of everything for you till you're well, Toad, said the Mole. We'll see your money isn't wasted, as it has been. No more of those regrettable incidents with the police, Toad, said the Rat, as they thrust him into his bedroom. And no more weeks in hospital, being ordered about by female nurses, Toad, added the Mole, turning the key on him. They descended the stair. Toad shouting abuse at them through the keyhole, and the three friends then met in conference on the situation. It's going to be a tedious business, said the badger, sighing. I've never seen Toad so determined. However, we will see it out. He must never be left an instant unguarded. We shall have to take it in turns to be with him till the poison has worked itself out of his system. They arranged watches accordingly. Each animal took it in turns to sleep in Toad's room at night. They divided the day up between them. At first, Toad was undoubtedly very trying to his careful guardians. When his violent paroxysms possessed him, he would arrange bedroom chairs in a rude resemblance of a motor car, and would crouch on the foremost of them, bent forward and staring fixedly ahead, making uncouth and ghastly noises until the climax was reached, when, turning a complete somersault, he would lie prostrate amidst the ruins of the chairs, apparently completely satisfied for the moment. As time passed, however, these painful seizures grew gradually less frequent, and his friends strove to divert his mind into fresh channels. His interest in other matters did not seem to revive, and he grew apparently languid and depressed. One fine morning, the rat, whose turn it was to go on duty, went upstairs to relieve Badger, whom he found fidgeting to be off and stretch his legs in a long ramble around his wood, down his earths and his burrows. Toad is still in bed, he told the rat outside the door. Can't get much out of him except leave me alone. He wants nothing. Perhaps he'll be better presently. It may pass off in time, but... Don't be unduly anxious. Now, look out, Rat. When Toad's quiet and submissive and playing at being the hero of a Sunday school prize, he's at his artfulest. There's sure to be something up. I know him. Well now, I must be off. How are you today, old chap? inquired the Rat cheerfully as he approached Toad's bedside. He had to wait some minutes for an answer, 
And at last, a feeble voice replied, Thank you so much, dear Ratty. So good of you to inquire, but... First, tell me, how are you yourself from the excellent Mole? Oh, we're all right, replied the Rat. Mole, he added incautiously, gone out for a run around with Badger. They'll be out till luncheon. So you and I will spend a pleasant morning together, and I'll do my best to amuse you. Now jump up, there's a good fellow. Don't lie moping on a fine morning like this. Dear, kind rat, murmured Toad. How little you realise my condition. How very far I am from jumping up now, if ever. But do not trouble about me. I hate being a burden to my friends, and I do not expect to be one much longer indeed. I almost hope not. Well, I hope not too, said the rat heartily. You've been a fine bother to us all this time, and I'm glad to hear it's going to stop. And in weather like this, and the boating season just beginning, it's too bad of you, Toad. It isn't the trouble we mind, but you're making us miss a lot. I'm afraid it is the trouble you mind, though, replied the Toad. I can quite understand it. It's natural enough. You're tired of bothering about me. I mustn't ask you to do anything further. I'm a nuisance, I know. You are indeed, said the Rat. But I tell you, I'd take any trouble on earth for you, if only you'd be a sensible animal. If I thought that, Ratty, murmured Toad more feebly than ever, then I would beg you, for the last time probably, to step round to the village as quickly as possible. Even now it may be too late. And fetch the doctor. But don't you bother, it's only a trouble and perhaps we may as well let things take their course. Why? What do you want a doctor for? inquired the rat, coming closer and examining him. He certainly lay very still and flat and his voice was weaker, his manner was much changed. Surely you've noticed of late, murmured Toad. But no, why should you? Noticing things is only a trouble. Tomorrow, indeed, you may be saying to yourself, oh, if only I'd noticed sooner, if only I'd done something. But no, it's a trouble, never mind. Forget that I asked. Look here, old man, said the rat, beginning to get rather alarmed. Of course I'll fetch a doctor to you, if you really think you want him. But you can hardly be bad enough for that yet. Let's talk about something else. I fear, dear friend, said Toad with a sad smile, that talk can do little in a case like this. Or doctors either, for that matter. Still, one must grasp at the slightest straw. And by the way, while you're about it, I hate to give you additional trouble, but I happen to remember that you will pass the door. Would you mind at the same time asking the lawyer to step up? It would be a convenience to me, and there are moments, perhaps I should say a moment, when one must face disagreeable tasks at whatever cost to exhausted nature. A lawyer? Oh, he must be really bad, the rat said to himself. He hurried from the room, not forgetting to lock the door carefully behind him. Outside, he stopped to consider. The other two were far away, and he had no one to consult. It's best to be on the safe side, he said, on reflection. I've known Toad fancy himself frightfully bad before without the slightest reason, but... I've never heard him ask for a lawyer. If there's nothing really the matter, the doctor will tell him that he's an old ass and cheer him up, and that'll be something gained. I'd better humour him and go. It won't take very long. So he ran off to the village on his errand of mercy. The toad, who had hopped lightly out of bed, as soon as he heard the key turn in the lock, watched him eagerly from the window. 
until he disappeared down the carriage drive. Laughing heartily, he dressed as quickly as possible in the smartest suit that he could lay his hands on at the moment, filled his pockets with cash which he took from a small drawer in the dressing table, and next, knotting the sheets from his bed, tying one end of the improvised rope around the central mullion of the handsome Tudor window, which formed such a feature for his bedroom, he scrambled out, slid lightly to the ground, and taking the opposite direction to the rat, marched off light-heartedly, whistling a merry tune. It was a gloomy luncheon for Rat when the badger and the mole at length returned, and he had to face them at table with his pitiful and unconvincing story. The badger's caustic, not to say brutal, remarks may be imagined, and therefore passed over, but it was painful to the rat that even the mole, though he took his friend's side as far as possible, could not help saying, You've been a bit of a duffer this time, Ratty. Toad, too, of all animals. He did it awfully well, said the crestfallen rat. He did you awfully well, rejoined the badger hotly. However, talking won't mend matters. He's got clear away for the time, that's certain. The worst of it is he'll be so conceited with what he'll think is his cleverness that he may commit any folly. One comfort is we're free now, and needn't waste any more of our precious time doing sentry go. But we'd better continue to sleep at Toad Hall for a while longer. Toad may be back any moment, on a stretcher or between two policemen. So spoke the badger, not knowing what the future held in store, or how much water, and of how turbid a character, was to run under bridges before Toad should sit at ease again in his ancestral hall. And that is where we close the book tonight on this episode of Down to Sleep. <laughs>